So today I want to talk to you about Jubilee. Everybody say Jubilee. Jubilee. And I actually have two titles to this message. Uh, the one is going to be, uh, I'm going to repeat often. Uh, the other I just want to throw in for a moment. And I want to ask you the question is, will you build it? Will you build it? Here's the second thing. I, it's just an overarching theme. Jubilee for me and for thee. We live in a culture where those in power say, it's not good for you, but it's okay for me. If you haven't witnessed and haven't noticed that. Politicians, leaders, others, you know, these standards, they apply to you people, but they don't apply to me. And I just want to let you know that Jesus wants to set you free, but not just you. It's jubilee for me and jubilee for thee. I'm asking you to not only receive today, but I'm asking you to make a decision that you're going to build it. Helen Keller once said, the only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. See, the older that you get, you begin to lose your vision. As, as I shared with you, I went to, uh, I went to uh, the eye doctor. She was amazing. And, uh, and we went through the test, and she said, is it, is it better? Is it worse? Is it better? Is it worse? Come on, just be honest. How many of you lied during that, that time? You have no idea. It all looks the same, right? You're like, it all looks worse, but I think I should say better. So I went, she gave me what is called progressive lenses. And it means your eyes are getting progressively worse. And I said, well, that doesn't sound bad. I don't, I don't want bifocals. She's like, no, no, we're not giving you bifocals. I went home, I Googled it, I looked it up, and I actually have trifocals. That's what progressive lenses are. And so now I'm seeing clear, I'm seeing better, and I just want to let you know that God wants your vision to increase. He wants it to get better and greater for the future that he has for your one and only life. The Bible says, without vision, people perish. Another translation says, without vision, people cast off restraint. Here's another way that it said, when people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. In other words, if you have a vision to be skinny, you won't eat the cheesecake. (laughs) If you have a vision to be debt-free, you're not going to buy the 80-inch screen TV in your house. If you have a vision to stay married, you're not going to go on Tinder. Come on, somebody. If you have a, if you have a, vision, if you have a vision to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth and to set people free, you're going to seek first the kingdom of God because you understand if you do that, everything else will be added to you. Everything. Everything. And so, the 50th year of our church, the year of Jubilee, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, they celebrated the Jewish people every 50 years. And every 50 years, this year year of Jubilee meant your debts were erased. It was a -a once-in-a-lifetime experience. All the prisoners and those who were captive were set free, and all land was restored to its original owner. Now, the Bible says in Leviticus 25, which Leviticus is a very exciting book, (laughs) if you've ever read it, it takes a little commitment, but there's good stuff that's in there. It says, set this year apart as holy. This is what I believe the word from heaven for you and I is this year. Set this year apart as holy. These are banner years, years of favor, years of freedom. It's a time of jubilee. A time to proclaim freedom throughout the land for all who live there. It will be a jubilee year for you. This 50th year will be a jubilee year for you. Now, in the book of uh, Luke, chapter 4, Jesus came onto the scene, and uh, he came, and he was proclaiming and declaring that it's not a -a once-in-a-lifetime experience anymore. You don't have to wait 50 years to experience freedom, and I didn't just come to erase your financial debts. I came to take care of your sin, to set you free from bondage, and to restore everything in your life that the enemy has stolen from you. So Jesus went to church that day in the synagogue, and he unrolled the scroll. And if you want to know what God wants to speak to you, how much he loves you, and all that God has for you, including the thousands of promises in the word of God that are waiting to be believed and received, you got to do what Jesus did that day and unroll the scroll. 
Open the word of God. Turn off Netflix. Stop scrolling on your phone and just say, you know what? I'm tired of existing. I want to live today and this year. These will be my banner years. Favor, freedom, and jubilee. So I want you to lean in. I want you to get fired up. I want you to get ready because God wants to do something. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is on me. And he has anointed me to be hope for the poor, freedom for the brokenhearted, new eyes for the blind, and to preach to prisoners, you are set free. And then he said, I have come to share the message of Jubilee. For the time of God's great acceptance has begun. He was proclaiming and declaring to people in his hometown, I'm not just a boy, I'm the savior of the world. I'm the son of the most high God. And when you find me, you find life and you're forever changed. I love that the time of God's great acceptance has begun. How many of you have ever played? It's an amazing game. It's not better than Uno, but it's close. Hungry, hungry hippo. Come on, somebody. If you did that, come on, uh, Center County, let me know online. Hungry, I love hungry, hungry hippo. Now, when you buy it and you play it later as an adult, you remember like, man, I thought we played this for hours, but it normally stops being fun after about seven or eight minutes because <laughs> you're just doing the same thing. You know, you can only, you know, hungry. But I love that image because hungry, hungry hippo, it's kind of like at nighttime when you're snacking and you'll eat almost anything. Come on, isn't that true? You get hungry enough, you'll eat butter. You're just like, come on, it's ice cream, it's cold. I want it all, hungry hippo. That's the picture. God wants everyone. Skinny, fat, tall, short, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus wants everybody. He wants you to come home to the grace of God, to the love of God, to the family of God. He wants to set you free. He wants the whole world. He wants the whole world. God desires. So you might be saying, is that for me? <laughs> it's for me and it is for thee. So let's talk about it for a few moments. When you unroll the scroll, you begin to discover who you are in Christ. Again, in the Old Testament, uh, the old agreement, the 50th year was of great importance. It was known as the year of Jubilee. During that time, people were set free from their uh, physical needs. Jesus came, and he, he, he wants to take care of our physical needs, but he's setting us free from the inside out, and he has declared jubilee over our lives. So we've talked about that these last couple weeks, that Jesus is our jubilee. He has come to set us free. That Jesus is willing, and Jesus is able. A lot of people are willing, but only Jesus is able. And we encourage you to build your life on the words of Jesus, not on the shifting sands of culture or the opinions of man, but to build it on the truth that never changes that's found in Jesus. In Colossians 2, it says, you were dead. Everybody say, you were dead? dead. It was weekend at Bernie's, man. You, were, you thought you were alive, but you weren't. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all your sins. Past, present, and future, by the way. And he canceled the record of charges against us, and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. Absolutely incredible. I'm going to take you for a few moments to the book of Genesis. Jesus believed the book of Genesis, by the way. And the scholarship and the opinions of man, they say, well, you know, they're stories, they're allegories. Nobody really believes that. Well, Jesus did. And that Jesus was either who he claimed to be or he wasn't. There's no in between. And Jesus affirmed these stories. In fact, if you don't believe the beginning of Genesis, you won't believe any of the Bible. Because it's going to affect everything that you see in the world. And the Bible says in Genesis 6 that the Lord observed. Everybody say observed. observed. He observed some things. He said the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. Not much has changed. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and and put them on earth. It broke his heart. The Lord said, I'll wipe this human race that I've created from the face of the earth, and I'll destroy every living thing. And all the people, the large animals, 
the small animals that scurry along the ground, even the birds of the sky. I'm sorry I ever made them. And then verse 8 says something powerful. It says, but. Everybody say, but. but. <laughs> you ever have those conversations where everybody says, you know, I love you, but <laughs> I'm breaking up with you. <laughs> I mean, that bucking me lots of things. So God's like, you know what? Everybody's dead. I'm tired of it. Justice, judgment, but. Everybody say, but. But, but Noah found favor. But Noah found favor. Did you hear me? But Noah found favor with the Lord. Because God wasn't on a witch hunt. He was on a grace hunt. Looking for someone that would believe and trust in him. So God spoke to Noah. And he said, Noah, I want you. I'm going to rescue the world. Now, most of the worlds, they're not going to listen. They're not going to come. But I want you to get your family. I'm going to send uh, the animals two by two. And, uh, and I want you to build an ark. It's going to take you a few decades. <laughs> you're going to build it on dry ground and everybody's going to think you're insane. Come on, somebody. Yeah. They're going to think you're crazy. You're going to build it and you're going to use your time. You're going to use your ability and you're going to use your money. And through you, I'm going to save the world. So Noah, you got some favor. Now you got a job to do. Let's get rolling. And the Bible says in the book of Genesis, when you read the story, that Noah and his sons labored <laughs> and family for many, many decades until they eventually would build the ark. Now, there's evidence of a worldwide flood all over the world, though man tries to say, well, that's not the case and all those things, because you're going to believe what you'll see from a spirit that's dead or that's alive. Now, let's talk about this for a moment because this is a big deal. Are you ready? Because I'm asking you today, will you build it? Well, Sam, we don't live in the days of Noah. We don't need to build an ark. There was a prophetic word that was given over our church during this decade of destiny. Uh, Pastor Robert Cameron, part of uh, uh, our Wave Collective, Wave Church, dear friend, he'll be here later this year. He came and he spoke a message and he said, you guys are building an ark for the saving of generations. That stuck with our church. That stuck in my heart and I think about it often. Every time I drive by uh, land that we own, every time I drive by people that we want to reach, I'm saying we need to build an ark for the saving of generations. I want you to jump over with me to Matthew chapter 24. Verse 37, it says, When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and Instagram and Facebook and, <laughs> and weddings and right up to the time that Noah entered the boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. And this is, what, this is the way it'll be when the Son of Man returns. Jesus said, I'm going to come back. I hung on a cross for you. I died in your place. I ascended to the right hand of the Father where I intercede for you now. But there will be a day where my Heavenly Father will tap me on the shoulder and he's going to say, go get them. I prepared a place for them. Jesus will return. We are living in those days and in those times. People didn't realize what was going to happen when Noah entered the ark and a flood came and swept them all away. And this is the way it'll be when the Son of Man comes. Two will be working together in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. You two must keep watch. You don't know what day your Lord is coming. And understand this. If the homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. So you must be ready at all times for the Son of Man will come when you least expect it. You're like, I thought this was Vision Sunday. This is a Debbie Downer. Wah, wah. No, it's not. I want to let you know that, that God came and he destroyed the world by flood because of sexual perversion, 
violence, uh, the, the, just the sinfulness and wickedness of that day, and there's evidence all around it. But God said, I want you to look at the rainbow. It is a covenant that I have with you. I'll never flood the earth and destroy it again. Instead, he's bringing a flood of favor, a flood of goodness and mercy. He's bringing a time of jubilee that you can find freedom no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. You can experience the grace of God, the mercy of God. It's like hungry, hungry hippo. He wants you to come. It doesn't matter how clean you are, dirty you are, what's your background or pedigree. If you'll say, Jesus, I need you, he'll come and he'll rescue you and set you free in Jesus' name. All right. Stay standing for a moment because I'm going to let you know our church, you're going to like this or maybe you won't, but you might as well be ready. Our church is going to preach hell hot and it's going to preach heaven great. Boys are still boys. God created them male and female. Women are still women. Marriage is still between husband and wife. Abortion is still murder. Racism is still wrong. Jesus is alive. The Holy Spirit is healed. The sick are still to be healed. The dead will still be raised. He's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. And I'm asking you, will you build that kind of church that can help lost and broken people? Make sure you download the app because it won't be long. We won't be on socialism media. They'll be censoring stuff like that. You may be seated. And I'm not kidding. All right, let's lighten it for a moment. Can I have my, my costume? Do you like my suit? Everybody's so shocked. I've worn more suits in the last two months than I wore in 22 years. You say, why are you doing that? I don't know, just to change it up. Come on, don't you just get bored? You just say, I just need to, need to change it up. I promise I can do this. I practiced. <laughs> hey, thanks, man. Come on. Give it up for Jay bowl I was thinking, it's about time someone help me. Come on. I'm just... <laughs> In Ezekiel 32, or 22, it says, I looked for someone who might rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. I searched for someone to stand in the gap in the wall so I wouldn't have to destroy the land. But I didn't find anyone. Walls were protection around countries, around cities, communities. And when there was a breach in the wall, it meant destruction could come by the enemy at any time. God used this language From Ezekiel, when Moses stood before the people and before him, and Moses interceded on their behalf and said, I know they should know better. They've watched you do all these miracles, but they still don't know better. How many of you relate? Come on, how many of you, just be honest, you relate to the Israelites? You know better, but you don't always do better. Aren't you thankful for the grace of God? And the Bible says that Ezekiel was prophesying. Moses, he stood in the gap. In Genesis 18, Abraham interceded for Sodom. He didn't just yell at the world. He prayed that they would be saved and that God would do something uh, in their lives. Stephen prayed for those that were stoning him. Here's the deal, guys. We need to love everybody, and we need to even love our enemies. That does not mean we love their wickedness. Come on, somebody. But we need to love everybody. Paul prayed for the salvation of Israel even in the midst of his persecution. And Jesus stood on the gap when he hung on the cross and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. A few years ago, a friend of mine told me a story, and then I got some application. I'll give this to you in a few moments. He told me a story that I want to uh, tell to you. And then I want to explain why I have this vest on, because you're like, that that looks really nice. (laughs) So he told me the story that uh, he was on staff at a church, and uh, he uh, had a middle school program. He would take the kids home uh, in in the evening when when they would meet. He had a van, he would drop them off. And uh, one of the parents was a police officer and would often come in behind the van and just follow them home just to, to be there. Sometimes throw his lights on and, and just mess around with them and, 
and uh, all those different things. And, and one day, he said, guys, when we, we're going to do something different. Because I notice so-and-so's dad is behind us. We're going to, when I, when I stop the vehicle at the traffic light, we're going to, can we, are we still allowed to say this, do the Chinese fire drill? How many of you have ever done that? I don't even know where that term comes from. I have no idea. If that's offensive, then I don't, sorry, I don't even know. We'll Google it later. We used to get out and run around the car. Come on, you ever do that? Why? I have no idea. It's the dumbest thing ever. And then he got out because he was all excited. And he said, he said, I started dancing like, woo, woo, ooh, ooh. You know, all, that's the best I got. <laughs> Running around the car, dancing at the officer that was sitting behind them on the road whose lights were on. Running back and forth to the car. And all of a sudden, the officer got out, and it was not that boy's dad. He found himself on the ground in handcuffs in front of all the middle schoolers in the church van. And for the next half hour, <laughs> the, fortunately, the police chief knew him. So when the officer called it in, I think I have this drug guy who's on drugs or something. Next half hour, the, the chief was saying, don't arrest him. Don't put him in jail. Just give him a warning. Trust me, I know him. He needed someone to say, listen, <laughs> don't put him in jail. Don't do that to him. So there's a, there's a highway. It's a highway to heaven. It's a highway to hell. And you and I get to choose. God has made it incredibly obvious. All men know the truth. Jesus came and lived, and he died and resurrected publicly. He says, all men are without excuse. He doesn't have to prove anything to you. You know that he loves you. You know that he's for you. And I want you to know the good news of Jesus no matter what you've done. But we need some people in this house that won't stand by and say, have you ever driven up on, a, on an accident before? And there's, there's uh, the, the fire trucks are there and the emergency services. And someone's dressed like this. And they stand and they're waving you down. What are they doing? They're saying, you can't go this way, you need to go that way. Because if you keep going this way, well, you're going to drive into an accident. There could be wrecked cars, people there, you wouldn't see them, you wouldn't know. There could be down power lines, there could be all kind of issues. And because this person knows, they're telling you, hey, just want to let you know, I don't want you to go this way, it's dangerous, I want you to go this way so you can make it to your destination. God's still say, saying, will there be people that will stand in the gap in their generation, that will build an ark, that will let people know that God loves them? Will anyone care less about their lives and more about God's kingdom, that they'll say, hey, hold up, my child's coming down the road, and I don't want them to go into danger and go to hell. I'm going to direct them to heaven. Hey, my neighbor's driving this way. Will someone wave and say, no, 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 I don't want you to go this way. I want you to go this way. Will someone in their neighborhood, in their community, come on, in this nation get up and say hey I, there's a there's a there's a real hell and a real heaven and I don't want you to go there I want you to come to the grace of God and the mercy of God and the love of God and I'm just wondering will there be a church uh, on the side of the hill in the middle of nowhere that'll stand up and say in my day and this hour I know there's danger but I'm going to take a stand and I'm going to tell people hell is not for you heaven is for you the grace of God is for you the love of God God is for you. And as long as I'm alive, I'm going to be a holy roadblock that keep you from going to where the enemy wants you. So how do we do that? How do we do that? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and I'm the life. We'll get censored for that too. Jesus was censored for that. In fact, they killed him. I'll take my other jacket. Thank you very much. Come on, get her for grace. Isn't she amazing? And single, by the way. <laughs> Matthew 7 says, Go through the narrow gate because the gate to hell is wide, and the road that leads to it is easy, and there are many who will travel it. If you find yourself going with the mainstream, you're probably going down the wrong stream. See, Jesus wants people 
that will follow him, be fired up, and be willing to give their lives to say, you know what? I know you're not happy that I'm not letting you go down this path. I know that you're irritated because you're going to go down this road and you're not sure how you're going to get there and you really want to get home this way and you really want to do this thing and you really want to sleep with that person and you really want to act this way and you want to say this and you want to live your life this way but I love you too much to let you keep going that way because I know it will destroy you. So I'm going to point to Jesus because he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. So here's what you need to know. Your life is an ark. Your life is an ark. Now Jesus is the ark of the New Testament. That we look to him, we're saved. But because you have Jesus, your life is an ark. And when people come to you, they should come to Jesus. Brother Richard, who is an amazing man of God who served our, our church for many decades, one of my dear friends who went to be at the Lord. Brother Richard, uh, whenever someone was close to death, they would call and I'd say, Richard, it's time for you to go. Because I knew that if Richard went, they were going to get saved. Just by encountering him. He was so good at it. I said, I'm pretty good, but you're, you're really good. Like, like you, you just bring people to Jesus. I nicknamed him the closer. <laughs> when Brother Richard is coming to visit you, you're either getting healed or you're getting ready to meet Jesus. One of the two. <laughs> he didn't know that, but... <laughs> true Matthew chapter 5 says you are the light of the world a town built on a hill that cannot be hidden neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl instead they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house in the same way let your light shine before others so they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven now we're passionate we're preaching but listen here's the deal we're not yelling at the world we're loving the world we're declaring the goodness of God that you can have you can have freedom you need to know that your family is an ark. Joshua 24, 15. But as for me and my household, my household, Joshua declared, we will serve the Lord. He said, if serving the Lord seems desirable, undesirable to you, then you can choose for yourselves this day who you're going to serve. But I know where my house stands. I know where my, my allegiance is. And it's, and it's not with the kingdoms of this world. It's not with the right or the left, Republican or Democrat. It's with the kingdom. It's with Jesus. I'm not of this world. I'm made for eternity. And if there's anyone that I'm going to celebrate, I'm not on the Trump train or the Biden train or anybody else's train. We're on the Jesus train, and we're going forward with the goodness and the mercy and the grace of God. And any train that you jump on, I'm telling you, you're going to be really disappointed because any leader is not Jesus or the Antichrist. I know we talk about them like they are, aren't they? Man, I'm pretty sure they might be the Antichrist. I'm pretty sure you don't read the Bible then. But let's continue on. Everybody say, I love the little preacher. I think he's a sweet little man. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Your family's an ark. I think of Dan and Donna Fisher, who are establishing a community down in the, in the Keys, where they moved to, of people that meet together in their home. We'll have a thriving church there one day, too. But I think of their children and their grandchildren. I think of uh, their son-in-law, Brian, who was up here leading, uh, helping lead worship. I think of uh, Erica, how uh, amazing woman of God she is. I think of Pastor Chad, who's led the generations in worship for, it'll be 20 years this year. And absolutely, all the talents, gifts, and abilities you see, in part is because of his leadership. I think of that family, that family's an ark. I want to have a family that's an ark that brings people to the grace and the mercy of God. This church is an ark. Not the building. Jesus said, I'll build my church, the people. Now, buildings are a part of it because we use them. as somewhere to meet. So we don't worship a building. We're thankful for them. We're going to build a building. It's a lot of money, but it's not about the building. That's not what is impressive. What is impressive when marriages are restored. What's impressive is when someone's life is healed. What's most impressive is when 4,100 plus people make decisions to follow Jesus and are no longer headed to hell, but they're headed to heaven for eternity.
And I'm just asking you, Jesus said, I'll build my church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be uh, uh, loosed in heaven. And you know what? In other words, it's a divine partnership. You and I can partner with the, the King of kings and the Lord of lords to bring heaven to earth and to rescue people. I'm just asking you, will you build it? Will you build it? Will you not just be a spectator? Yeah, I go to church. What does that even mean? You are the church. We go and meet together. I understand the terminology. But we're family. We're a part of something. Even if one day you leave this church, I don't like him. He talks too much about whatever. You're still spending eternity with me. And if you mouth off too much, Jesus may just put you right beside my mansion. Come on, somebody. <laughs> that ain't in the Bible. That ain't in the Bible. <laughs> Genesis 6, Noah did everything exactly as God commanded. Can you imagine being Noah? God's like, all right, I want you to get all this wood, do all this stuff, tar, and you're going to build all this stuff. And you're going to spend like 100 plus years. It's going to be awesome, Noah. You're just going to build this thing in the middle of the desert. Everybody's going to think you're insane. And, and, and you're going to be mocked and ridiculed. And, and, and they're going to ask, why are you building it? And you're going to have to tell them, well, because you're all evil. And God's going to destroy you unless you turn from your sins. <laughs> Every time. And Noah did exactly what God commanded him to do. Will you? Will you build it? Because Noah did it in his day. Ezekiel stood up in his day. Abraham stood up and said, God, don't destroy these people. Save these people. Use me. Jesus did it. And now he said, I'm going away. Now I want you to go do it and tell them about me. So if you say yes, here's what that means. It means you need to obey whatever God tells you to do. How do you build an ark? I was putting up, uh, um, I can't even think the name, not blinds, but drapes. And, and I had a problem and it had the right drill bit and it took a week. In my office, three little windows Michelle's like, you going to call somebody? I'm like, no, I can do it. <laughs> Bought the drill bit, got the wrong size. Screw wouldn't go in. It was, it was something. I don't know if I was drilling it into the window. I have no idea what's going on. Next owner can worry about that. But they're up. I'm not a good builder. But I want to be really good at building an ark. And here's what that means for you and I. You're going to live a little while. Not as long as you think. This life is a vapor, it's a mist. While you're on earth, the only thing that's worth anything is building what God builds. And he wants to build an ark for the saving of generations through your life, through your family, through our church. You do it by using your time. Very simple. Ecclesiastes said, there's an opportune time to do things. A right time on earth for everything. Another church sacrifice they built, not this, this facility, but they built a church that would impact the generations. And too often, we appreciate what others do. But here's the deal. To really show honor is not just to say, I appreciate. To really show honor is to take what's given and make it better. And to move it forward. I, I think of the Gibsons, the Masts, the Weggers. I think of, for 25 years, they would roll food in and out of this facility and feed hungry families in our community. They said, there's a lot of other things that we can do, but we're going to do something to let the world know that Jesus loves them. We're going to use our time. Will you? Sam, what does that mean? I don't know. The Holy Spirit wants to speak to you, but he wants you to build it. He wants you to use your talent. I think of how for eight weeks, we transformed this 37,000 square foot facility so that we could all meet here together while the schools are closed and all these different things. I think of all the people that sacrificed in that time. I think of Heath and Cody and their team that ran all the electrical. I mean, there's so much electrical work in here. It looks like there's a pipe organ on the walls. It's, it's, it's incredible. I think of Dan Fisher and teams and others that have saved our church at the minimal hundreds of thousands of dollars who've gone and ministered to other churches. I think of all the people that have used their talent 
I, I think of Kathy who used her talent to help start that first children's ministry. And I think of everyone else who's been a part in the last 50 years since then. Will you use your talent? Ecclesiastes, Solomon said, whatever you do, do well. Not half-hearted, not lazy, not like, well, you know, if I get the mood, maybe once every six weeks I'll go to church. Maybe once in a while I'll throw a few dimes in the, in, in the bucket, feel good about me. Yeah, if somebody really needs something, I'm not too busy, maybe I'll help. Maybe God hasn't called us to be selfish. Maybe God has called us to give our lives and to live it, to build an ark to save generations. Colossians 3 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. I want you to stand with me. I have one more point. You can write this down. And story I want to tell you, and then we're going to close. God wants you to, God wants you to use your treasure. He wants you to use your treasure. What does that mean? Your money. Because money helps do things, doesn't it? Money says to a building, I can build you. Money says to a, to a broken family, I can resource you. Money can do some things. People say, ah, oh, it's not about money. Church just talks about, no, we don't. But God wants to use money. And the Bible says, don't store up your treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them. Where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy it. And thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. I'll give you an opportunity to respond to the grace of God in just a moment. Going a little long today. But I want to tell you one more story before I give an opportunity to respond to the gospel. Earl and Sarah Howe. Earl and Sarah Howe were at our church for many years. Wonderful people. They never had much. You know, from the world's economy, maybe lower middle class. They had a home they worked for, they retired. They were just good people. They would come into the office on a weekly basis. They'd help fold programs and and Sarah, she had had a stroke, and so later in life, she, she was kind of losing her mental faculties, which made uh, times in the office rather entertaining. She would say some things that could not be repeated. <laughs> she would do some things that you wouldn't expect it, but she had a heart for God's house. I remember talking with Earl and Sarah. They would tell me stories. He would tell me about how he was a newborn and to keep him warm. They didn't have incubators. They just put him on the wood stove in a, in a container. I'm like, they put you in a wood stove as a premium. All these things. One day, Earl died. Got the phone call. Heartbroken. And uh, Sarah had to take care of herself. She was in a home at this point. She said, great difficulty. She ended up passing, going to be with the Lord. And I got a message from someone in the church. They said, hey, we want to let you know something. Earl and Sarah, they loved the church. In fact, they said they loved coming every week and people always got saved. And they didn't have any children. They didn't have a lot. But I went with them and everything they had, they went the church to have. They gave their home. We fixed that, that home up. We sold it. That couple of meager means gave the largest one-time gift in the history of this church. And I honor them today. And many of the thousands of people that will be in heaven will be in heaven in part because of their generosity and their sacrifice. So for us, what does that mean? We need to build an ark for the saving of generations. Our life is an ark, our family is an ark, our church is an ark. And we need to use our time, our talent, and our treasure. And I just want to ask you today, will you build it? Or like so many in our culture say, Jubilee for me, but not for thee. It's all about me. Or you say, no, 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 Jesus came to give Jubilee for me and for thee and to reach you, and to love you, and to save you, and to help you, and to restore you, and to heal you, and to rescue you, and to let you know that there's a God in heaven that loves you, and to love you so much he sent Jesus to die on the cross. I just want to let you know that because of Jesus, these are our banner years, and we're going to live a jubilee life full of favor.